to have a low environmental footprint on the planet, and that means reducing your carbon consumption towards zero. Now, can you do that in a short space of time and get out of burning all fossil fuels? In theory, you can do anything. But I would point out to you, you ought to be able to go out and vote to probably halve your standard of living. Let's celebrate the fact that we can now do entirely without fossil fuels. Because fossil fuels have been polluting our air through their use in plastics, choking our planet. They've made us obese and unhealthy. They've made us deeply unequal. How about if you have solar panels on your roof and that's what drives your electric bike bicycle, you don't have to buy that from anyone else. That's your energy you're using, you're generating for yourself. And you're not paying money to multinational companies who very often have their, uh, their funds far away and paying very little tax. And there is, of course, the point about the planet we live on. And you don't have to believe me to say that we have to get rid of fossil fuels. Just look at the IPCC. They tell us we have 11 years now to turn this all around. If I ask the question here, who believes we need to re reduce emissions drastically? In absolutely, right? That's, that's fundamental. There's a very clear um, correlation between access to energy and human development. It helps you know, drive prosperity. It lights our lights. It helps us drive our cars, heat our homes, and so on. And actually, access to energy is, is obviously a good thing. It is a good thing. And 85% of that, at the moment, is coming from fossil fuels. But three quarters of the world's global emissions is coming from the use of energy. So something has to change. When you think about sort of where we are currently, we've got about 7 billion people in the planet. We're expecting another 2 billion to come along in the next 10, 20 years. We were just talking beforehand about uh, different projections on demand and at, the, at, at say, a conservative uh, look at demand. We're thinking a demand for energy is going to increase by about a third. So that's about another China, Africa, and India coming on line. But these things possibly even more. Um, coupled with the fact that at the moment we've got one billion people without any access to energy at all. So when we're thinking about sort of um, what approach you can take, and it's, it's not to sort of just point out, well, there's just endless barriers and it's all just too difficult. You, you do need quite a sophisticated to solu solution to what sounds like a very s simple sort of call to action. And so when you think about how you address that, I think uh, that does mean obviously huge investment in renewables. And renewables are growing faster than any energy source ever. It's fantastic. But they're about 4% of today. So it's huge. What we're expecting renewables to do is, is unprecedented. That's not to say it can't happen, but it's, it's challenging. Um, we mentioned, we talked about the IPCC, and absolutely, uh, their 1.5 degree scenario says it all needs to happen. We need to ha it happen, it needs to happen in the next 10, 12 years. But even if the scenario is <coughs> consistent with the Paris Agreement, we're looking at 2050 or so on, you, you still have a role for oil and gas because there's a recognition of the need to meet this demand. But, and crucially, and that's why I think the question isn't so much about fossil fuels, but maybe more about emissions but that oil and gas increasingly needs to get decarbonized. The way it works at the moment is our economic system benefits those who can benefit themselves, those who can use their energy or use their production to increase their standard of living or to increase other standard of living gain from the economic community. But maybe if we put more value on social or environmental standards, or maybe if we came up with a new way of valuing things entirely, that maybe that could change the way that we use energy and think about it. And I also do agree with the idea that not all of the big oil and gas companies are that bad. Obviously, they do burn loads and loads of oil and gas, and they do cause a lot of the problem. But if they're taking active steps, and if us as the consumers can lobby them and try to persuade them to change, then they can become a force for good. Because even though they're currently causing the problem, the power that they hold to create a force of good, if we can change their way, and they could actually become the most powerful force to 
renewable change. Energy companies need a forcing function. They are deeply, deeply uncredible and have a, such a bad track, rac track record of decarbonizing. Uh, just looking up quickly, um, BP has reduced its investment in R&D by 55% in the last eight years. Uh, it is getting its carbon credibility by buying small energy companies. It has had the most exploration since 2004, in spite of the fact that we know there are $2 trillion worth of stranded assets, i.e. assets which we already know exist in the ground. And we know that if we burn them, we go over two degrees and we shoot way up to four degrees. Just look around this room, okay? And think for yourself what you've done since you woke up this morning and write yourself a carbon diary. This room is utterly riddled with carbon. Right? Your clothes, coffee, the fertilizers that went to the whatever produced that, your breakfast, the packaging, the petrochemicals, uh, the loo paper, which is energy intensive, before you got in any form of transport <coughs> to get here. And don't kid yourself, an electric car is carbon free because it isn't. Okay? What we're talking about in decarbonisation is you rewriting that carbon diary with no carbon in it. Right? And that is an extraordinary demand. And we have this <coughs> nice little illusion that, and it's trotted out by the Climate Change Committee, that, you know, if we only do net zero emissions in Britain, that somehow we are no longer going to cause climate change. That's what they actually say. It's utter rubbish. We basically got out of making stuff. This country manufactures 20% of GDP. The rest is all services. You're all in services. We're in services here today. Where's the steel come from? Where's the cement come from? Where's the aluminium come from? Where's the fertilizers come from? Where are the petrochemicals come from? Well, they're all coming from abroad. The only serious way of being carbon net zero, which is the challenge we're trying to address in climate change, is to look at your carbon consumption, not your carbon production. It doesn't matter a damn where the emissions take place. It's just that there are emissions. And that's a starting point. And once you realize that, you realize that when people say we're living an unsustainable lifestyle, we're living beyond our carbon means, they're absolutely right. We haven't begun to think about how big the shock would be to actually decarbonize. And that leads to the second factual point that's really important. So I'm old enough to remember all the claptrap trotted out in 1990 about how we were going to save the planet and the build-up to the Framework Convention on Climate Change. I'd been on platforms pointing out to people in the build-up to Kyoto, etc. it's not going to work. Right? And what you get told is, oh, you must be in the, in the hands of the fossil fuel industry, or it must be some lobby who's paying for this, because how could you possibly say that? Of course it's going to work. Well, let me make two points. First of all, there's not a single blip in the growth of concentration of carbon in the atmosphere since 1990. It goes up at two parts per million per annum for every single year, and now it's going up at three. Not even the global financial crisis made any difference whatsoever. It's worse than a straight line. There's not a blip, nothing has been achieved in even levelling down that growth of emissions since 1990. And the other way of putting that is... The last 30 years have been the golden age of the fossil fuel industry. I think it's true that more fossil fuels have been burnt in the last 30 years than the rest of the century. So we're not getting anywhere. Stuff isn't happening. And if you look at the projections going forward, they're pretty dire. And I say this because I think we desperately have to address this question, but you have to be brutally <coughs> realistic about what's required to do it. You have to understand where you start from. So if we project forward on the current GDP rates of China, India, and Africa, by 230, there'll be two Chinas, two Indias, and two Africas. And just by the power of maths, by 240, there'll be four Chinas, four Indias, and four Africas in consumption terms. So we want to accommodate all that extra con consumption. Maybe it won't all materialize, but I assure you quite a lot will. You want to accommodate that against a baseline in which, so far, nothing at all has been achieved in moving forward. I'd love to think Kyoto is a great success and Paris is going to work. It isn't. Put the clock over there.
do we really need a screen anything like that size? Do we really need a screen at all? When this building was built 100 or so years ago, there would have been a clock that would have told people in this building the time. They would have used a little bit of, a, of, a, of, a, of half a calorie to twist the thing to wind up the clock. Are we really better for having that clock, that big screen up there using all that energy? You know, Katrina painted this picture of all this progress coming from energy use. If you look at, for example, producing food, it used to be 100 or so years ago when this building was built, we put one calorie of energy in to get three calories of food out in your wheat field or whatever. We now put 10 calories of energy in to get one calorie of food out. What we are doing is burning through massive quantities of energy for no good purpose at all. We have built an economic system that is built on that. We have Natalie's prescription, which is, hang on, let's go back to a world, right? but human beings have never gone back to anything, right? or we're going to hope for a, a set of inventions, and we're pinning our hopes on a futurology that we, that we can't predict. And, uh, and I have to say that I really worry about, Dita, this idea of kind of our individual responsibility in it, because the problem is I know that I don't have either the temperament or the time to commit to doing this well, right? And I'm skeptical of the hypocrisy of it. And I, I, I cycle to work, but if it's raining, I'm gonna get on the tube, right? I do want transport systems that are gonna work effectively. And, and you may say that screen's too big, Natalie, but I don't want a hand-powered dialysis machine. I, I, I think that there are things that, I think that, I think that we can't Im imagine that world. That I wanted to pick up on in closing, Ed, you, uh, characterized uh, traditional energy company <coughs> purchase of low carbon businesses as a, as a sort of window dressing. Uh, I think there's a really interesting discussion to be had here about whether it's window dressing or real. Uh, if uh, certainly on the on the tortoise responsibility 100 index, if a carbon intensive business buys a low carbon business and that shrinks its uh, uh, carbon footprint. Uh, lowers its carbon intensity. We give them credit for that. And I, I, th I mean, uh, we can dis continue this discussion, but uh, it, I think it, we've got to be fair on big oil, uh, big gas, big energy, uh, that that may be the way to transition out of fossil fuels.